You know, in ancient Greek, when people used to watch plays, they didn't go to the movies. Obviously, there weren't any cinemas there. There weren't any nice theatres like the Esplanade or MBS. Instead, if you go to Greece, you would see that there were big amphitheatres over there. And there weren't many cast. There weren't a big uh, lineup of actors and actresses there. In fact, there weren't even any actresses. There were only actors there. And so, with only a handful of actors, they would play the entire routine, the entire script for the whole audience. And how did they do that? Is because there would usually be one or a few actors who wears masks. And they wear masks to represent the different characters which they're playing. And then as the act goes by, they would change from one mask to another mask to represent that they are moving from one character to another character to another character. Okay, how many of you can guess what this actor's name is? What would you call this actor's name? In the Greek, they call it Hippocrates. Hippocrates. Okay, and that is obviously where we get this word hypocrite. Hypocrite, right? It's the changing of one's mask from that which, you know, you are in one setting and then when you go to another setting, you are a totally different person, right? And that's why, you know, when we're talking about Pharisees in these last few weeks, all of us know about how Jesus rebuked the Pharisees time and time again for being hypocrites. Why? Because uh, they would say one thing in the temple, but then when they're out there in real life, They'll act totally different. And I pray that at the end of this series, which is actually coming to a close already, that we won't be like the Pharisees. We won't be hypocrites. Instead, all of us will be, will be one. We'll be integrous. We'll be true and whole in God. And we'll be able to be consistent wherever we go. You know, every day, everywhere, whether we are in church on a Sunday or whether we are at work on a Monday, we are all the same and we don't change masks. Amen. And that's why we are talking about pharisectomy, getting the Pharisee out of you. Because, you know, the Pharisees were good in the outward appearance, but in actuality, their hearts were so far away and they, they were so good at simply checking off the list of laws in their land. They're so good at it that they love to create all of these you know, strict measures and be able to check off, check off, check off one by one thinking, oh, I'm so good, you know, I've done this, I've done that and thinking that the more they check off on the list, the more righteous they are. But how many of you know that that is not true? I love checking off lists actually. Uh, when I go grocery shopping, I love to come up with a shopping list, okay? And then I will go from one aisle to the other aisle to the other aisle as if it's like a race, you know? Getting all of these uh, items and putting it into my trolley and then trying to check the time and seeing how fast I can be able to complete my whole grocery shopping. How many of you know what I mean? How many of you do that? Yeah? who love to do that, and, and you pride yourself, right, in going from one end to the other end, and say, yes, I'm able to complete it, do that. And, you know, that is kind of like what the Pharisees did. They had this checklist, and they were like, just checking, 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 and said, yes, I've completed it already, yes, I've done my, my religious obligation, I'm made righteous, and because I'm made righteous, and therefore now I can dichotomize my life, I can now live my life as I wish. And I pray that that is not like us. And that's why um, Jesus, you know, although he acknowledged the righteousness of the Pharisees, he still told them that that isn't enough. That isn't enough. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. It, here, we, we see Jesus doing two things simultaneously. He's, he's acknowledging the righteousness of the Pharisees, but at the same time, Jesus is also telling the Pharisees that that is not enough. So, 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 says this, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was talking to his disciples, to his followers on the Sermon on the Mount. And he was telling them, even before he went on and told them about, you know, you say that uh, it's, you cannot murder, but I tell you that when you hate your brother, that is considered murder. You tell, I tell you, you know, about adultery, that even if you lust for a woman, that is already considered adultery. And he was putting that standard so high, and even before he was saying all this, he was telling his followers that, look, look at the righteousness of the Pharisees. You know that benchmark? Yeah, that's the benchmark for righteousness. But even when you get to that benchmark, that's not enough. Church, that's not enough. And that was a very high standard because back then in the Jewish culture, the Pharisees, you know, they were top tier. They were standard of righteousness. I kind of talked about this last week about how Nicodemus, right, was so righteous and yet God also told him, Jesus also told him that that's not enough and he needed to be born again. So the Jews respected the Pharisees so much. They, they, they would see the Pharisees as the epitome of righteousness. It's almost as if, you know, for those of us who are sports fans, if you think about football, we think about Messi. If we think about basketball, we think about Michael Jordan. Because you know, they're, they're at the top. They, they have already set the standard. So when you think about righteousness, you think about the Pharisees. And if the Pharisees had to do it, then they too, whoever we are, also had to follow what Jesus was saying. Think about it. It's like, imagine if... Uh, I, I use football as an analogy because... Uh, I love soccer. So, um, you know, imagine if Messi and his team, they were training. And now the trainer, the coach, um, if you all know the coach, his name is Ponchettino, and he's there and he, he's, he tells all the whole team, you know, guys, we need to get back to basics. You know, it's not enough training all this fanciful stuff. We need to get back to basics. Let's just take this whole afternoon to do passes to one another, just pass the ball to one another, just go through the basics, what would everybody do? Suddenly, everybody's eyes would turn to Messi, right? To turn to the top guy, the most expert guy, the guy with the most skills, right? And then they'll look at him and say, what is he doing? Is he going to follow or not? He sets the standard, he sets the pace. And so, if Messi then goes and says, okay, he takes the ball and then he passes and he just does the drills, what do the rest do? They don't complain. They just say, yes, let's go and do it because they set the pace. And that was what Jesus was doing. Jesus was saying, you see, the Pharisees, even them, even them, that's not enough because unless your righteousness surpasses the Pharisees, surpasses the Pharisees, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. Jesus recognized that if there was any group of people who resembled righteousness, it would be the Pharisee, but yet, you know, even the ability of checking off the list of laws of the land so that they could be called righteous wasn't enough for them to get into heaven. Maybe for some of us, we are thinking now, huh, even that one cannot. Ah. Then how? Then what else must I do? What more does God want of me? That's the question, right? What more then must I do to be able to get into heaven? What is God demanding of us as a church? Well, it's really simple. It's a four-letter word. God wants love. It's as simple as that. God wants love. L-O-V-E. Everything which God does can be derived from His heart of love. And everything which God wants can be simplified to this one word. Love. When asked what the greatest commandment is. Jesus replied to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He says this in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law 
and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Just on these two. To love. And you know, I'll argue that it's more difficult to love than to follow laws. How many of you will agree with me? It's more difficult to follow Jesus than to follow laws. And that's why when we see the Pharisees, it was so easy for Israel to get into this cycle of just wanting to follow, you know, what is written and go by the letter of the law. Because going by the letter of the law is like going shopping. You know, it's just ticking, ticking, checking off the list. And once you're done, you're done. And that's it, right? You can dichotomize your life, your shopping life with your, the rest of the life. But that's not true for our walk with God. Church, our walk with God is a walk of love, which doesn't just happen on a Sunday or during 15 minutes of your devotion time every morning or before you go to sleep. That's not, about our, that's not the journey of our faith. Our journey of our faith is every single step which we take, every single breath which we breathe. Church, that is our act of love to God in everything which we do. And so I pray that we will not be having that sacred, secular dichotomy in our lives, but instead we will be able to love, firstly love God and love our neighbours as well. Unfortunately, that was exactly what the Pharisees missed. They missed this point. They missed the heart of God, the heart of the reason why God even created the law in the first place. What do I mean? Now, turn with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 9. I know we are going through quite a number of scriptural verses this morning, but trust me, everything connects, and that's why I, I, I'm so excited to share it with you this morning. So Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 to 13, it says this, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew. This is Matthew the apostle. Okay, so, Saw a man called Matthew sitting at the text booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he, with Jesus, heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Church, imagine now that you hear of this man, right, who is able to heal the sick. Everywhere he goes, he's able to heal the blind, he's able to open up deaf ears, he's even able, and you hear, he's even able to raise the dead. Wow! And you are curious. And so one by one, you don't just go by yourself, but you call all of your friends to go. And so that was what was happening. All the people of Israel, they were hearing about this new guy, this prophet who was going around healing the sick. They wanted to check this man out. And guess what? So did the Pharisees, right? They also heard and they wanted to check who this Jesus was. But you see, instead of what the people were looking at, where the people were just wanting to see who this Jesus was so that he could help them, the Pharisees were actually just more concerned if Jesus were following the laws. The only question when they were looking at Jesus was, is this guy following all the rules? Well, look at him. It's okay to heal, but it's not okay to heal on the Sabbath. It's okay to eat with people, but it's not okay to eat with tax collectors and sinners. No, 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 that is not good. And if you think about this throughout the Gospels, the Pharisees, they were more concerned about following the laws than actually loving people. Did you get that? The Pharisees were more concerned about following the letter of the law than really loving people. And that is so sad because that is exactly what Jesus was talking about and just knew about that and that's why you know he replied right that there's no need for a physician for those who are healthy but for those who are sick for the sinners for the impure for the unrighteous that is the reason why i came so that they too may be righteous 
Jesus was challenging the Pharisees to pursue a life of love, but, you know, they were so blind by the mechanics of the law that they lost sight of the motive behind the law. They lost sight of why Jesus even came and did what he did. Now, I want to pause here for a moment and I just want to say this, right, that what we are preaching here is not against the law. Okay? I'm not here standing up before all of us and saying, forget the law. The law is bad and now we are living in an era of grace and the era of grace has no law. There's no such thing as that because I think Pastor Tim has mentioned time and time again that for there to be real, true grace, for grace to really abound, there has to be righteousness. There has to be the law over there to be able to balance it out and to show us how powerful grace is. And so that's why Jesus spoke to the Pharisees here in Matthew chapter 15, verse 7 to 8. Jesus says this, right? You hypocrites. Sorry, wrong verse. Okay. He said this, where am I? Yeah. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he said this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill it. But to fulfill it. What did Jesus mean by fulfilling it? Well, okay, now, pop quiz. When did God establish the law for Israel? When did God give the law to Israel? When? When they were in the wilderness. Just after they escaped from Egypt, right? Just as they were establishing themselves as a new nation. You see, when they were in Egypt, they were slaves. They were under the rule of the Egyptians. They had no law. They didn't know what it meant to be a free people, a free nation. And so right now, as they were out in the wilderness, they needed the law. They needed some structure, okay, to be a nation. And, they want, and God also gave them this law so that they would be holy, so that they would be set apart from other nations. But why? Why did they need to be set apart from other nations? Let's go back even further from Exodus to Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, right? God called Abraham to be a nation that he promised that he would be able to bless uh, Abraham and bless all who bless Abraham so that Abraham may be a blessing to all. Likewise for Israel. Israel is the result of Abraham, right? Israel was to be a blessing to all others. That's why they needed to be set apart. They wanted to be set apart, not just so that they could be isolated, but so that they could show the rest of the world what it really meant to follow God, what it really meant to trust God, and so that they could spread this message of truth, so that they could showcase the power of God, the faithfulness of God, the providence of God to the rest of the nations, that they too will be able to know who He is. And that is really the motive of the law. That was the objective, but it was forgotten. And time and time again, we read in the Gospel that the Pharisees, obsession with righteous living robbed them from the opportunity of loving others. It robbed them of the opportunity to love others. They may have loved God, church, but they certainly didn't love people. They may have loved God and said, God, you know, I'm following all these rules so that I can follow you, but back out in the well, when they saw everybody else who was suffering, all the sinners, all the tax collectors, the prostitutes, you know, they wanted nothing to do with them because that love which they had for God didn't translate to a love for people, for the love of His children. Have you ever met any Christians who say this? You know, I love God, but I don't like the church. Any of you met such people before? I love God, but I can't stand all the people in the church because, oh, you know, they are fussy, oh, they are hypocrites, oh, all of them are sinners, all of them are, are just so unrighteous. I just want to fix my eyes on God. God, you know what? My Christian faith is just you and me, right? It's just you and me. It's not about anybody else. And so I am just going to find myself in my prayer closet all by myself and the Holy Spirit and I'm not going to bother about anybody else. Now, church, is it possible for somebody to love God and not love the church? 
What do you think? Yes? No? Well, ponder with me for a moment. If Christ is the head of, and the church is the body, because, you know, we read in the Bible that the church is the body of Christ. Imagine if a husband, if I were to go up to Audrey, my wife, and say, Audrey, you know what? I love your head, but I don't like your body. How would that feel? How would that sound? It, I don't think it'll go down well, right? I'll probably be sleeping on the couch that night. It doesn't make sense. To love God is also to love others. And unfortunately, church, that is something which the Pharisees sorely missed out. They sorely lacked that. And my question to all of us, even as we hear this, there's a funny analogy I, I, I admit, but uh, now ponder about yourself for a moment. Have we been so obsessed with fulfilling our religious obligations that we forget to love each other? Not just the church and the people in it, but you know, also the people outside of the church. That is who God has sent out to impact as well. The sinful, the undeserving, those who don't talk like us or who look like us, who act like us. Are we also loving to them? Think about it. Who are our neighbours? Who are our neighbours? Right? Jesus answered that right when he was talking to the expert of the law. Once again, turn with me to Luke, Luke chapter 10. And we are going to read about this famous parable, which I'm sure if you have been in church for a few years, you definitely would have heard about this. In fact, it's so famous, many of us who have never been in church before probably will also have heard about this. In Luke chapter 10, this famous parable of the Good Samaritan. And starting from verse 31, it says this, In reply, Jesus said this, and he was asking, he was replying to the expert of the law who asked him, who is my neighbour, right? Jesus said, A man was going down to Jerusalem, uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, and now, Samaritans, they were despised by the Jews. But a Samaritan, a some, someone who was lower than people would, somebody who is different from the Jews. As he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him into an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave, it, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Then Jesus turns to the expert of the law and asks, right, which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Now the expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on the one who had mercy on him. Remember the word mercy? Sounds familiar, right? Where did we read that before? We read that actually in uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 9. Again, you know, I, I talk about cross-referencing. So uh, we go back to Matthew chapter 9 and that's where Jesus was saying, go and learn what it means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice for I came not to call the righteous but sinners. The parable of the Good Samaritan was a great illustration of this statement. Both the priest and the Levite, right, they were living sacrifices to God. They spent their entire life devoted to the temple, devoted to worship. In fact, as the priest, I would imagine he would have done countless sacrifices, who would have burnt countless offerings to God. He was an expert at sacrificing. And yet here in this parable, we see that both the priest and the Levite did not show mercy. Instead, it was the despised Samaritan, 
the one who Jews thought to be lower than themselves. He was the one who followed Jesus' command to love one another, to show mercy. And church, I pray that we will be like this good Samaritan who readily showed mercy to others who are in it. Even somebody who was not like him. Even before the injured man could have done anything to repay back the good deeds which the Samaritan did. It doesn't say that the, the, the injured man had money and passed the two denarii to the good Samaritan. And so the good Samaritan then took these two denarii and then paid it off to the innkeeper. It didn't say that. It said that even before this poor injured man who fell into the hands of the robbers did anything, the good Samaritan went and helped him. And I pray that we would be like that as well. So ready to accept people into our church with grace, even before they can change. Even before they are transformed by the power of God, we show them love. We exemplify to them who Jesus is. Amen. You know, the last few months, in fact, our church, Calvary, we have been very blessed because we have been seeing God uh, bring in more and more new ones. And especially as we go forth into the community and we make an impact for them ever more. Church, I pray that we will be ready to be like the Good Samaritan and to just accept them. You know, to just bless them. It doesn't matter whether they come to church or not. It doesn't matter whether they get transformed or not. Just allow us to be used by God as His outstretched arms of love, to love them just as where they are, to meet them in their need. And then from that, trust that the Holy Spirit will bring that conviction, that the Holy Spirit will do His work and we will be able to see salvations, we will be able to see transformation, not because of what we do or what we say or what we demand, but because of the grace of God. And all who agree say a big, Amen. Amen. Back to... Matthew chapter 9, we see that Jesus asked Matthew, the tax collector, to follow him even before Matthew could change. Even when Matthew was just at the text booth, Jesus said, come, follow me. In contrast, what did the Pharisees say? The Pharisees, when he saw the disciples and Jesus, you know, mixing around with the tax collectors and the sinners, he says, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners? And that's because the Pharisees focused on the problem, but Jesus focused on their potential. I pray that we will be able to focus on the potential of people instead of problems. I, I want to make a, a, a confession. This is not easy for me to say, actually, but um, I, I'm honestly guilty at the, of this. I just want to share it with you. Uh, this happened a number of years ago when I was actually um, planning an event. And I remember planning some events and then I was talking to Pastor Tim about planning an event and uh, getting people into the committee, right? And then Pastor Tim suggested, why don't you get this person? I said, no, but this person, a lot of trouble. Lah. This person ca cannot, cannot, fulfill what I need, you know. I need somebody who is competent. I need somebody who can do the job. Get me somebody else. Don't waste my time. And the event passed. And after a few years, this person, unfortunately, he, he went to a different church. And I remember having this feeling when God spoke to me and said, you know, you, that, that chance which you had to impact this person's life was missed. And I pray, church, that we would never ever have to experience that. That anybody who we approach, whether they are filled with problems or not, you know, we will be able to embrace them and we will be able to see beyond their problems, beyond their insecurities, beyond even their incompetence, and into their, po their potential, which God has placed in every single one of them. As I invite the worship team on stage, I just want to uh, show us this picture of a hospital. And uh, this was a picture which was shared with me by Pastor Tim. 
and it's a vision really of something which he sees of the church. You know, he saw three, three pictures. The first, he saw a hospital which was super clean. It was totally good okay, and sanitized. And the doctors and nurses, they, they were all so busy cleaning the hospital that it was in tip-top condition. But in order for it to be so clean, they refused all of the patients away. Say no patients, they're also dirty, especially now with the pandemic, right? We don't want to compromise our security. We don't want to compromise our cleanliness. And so no patients as, at all. The second picture is of a hospital there. But the, the doctors and the nurses, they were filtering down all who were coming in. Are you okay? Yes? Are you manageable? Can I, can I sort out your sickness? Okay? Yeah, not too bad. Right? Okay, then you can come in. But not everybody. Now, the third hospital, the third picture which Pastor Tim saw was a picture of a hospital fully filled with patients. Yes, there were some compromises in the cleanliness. Yes, there was blood spurting everywhere. There was, you know, vomit there. There were maybe, you know, some viruses kept going all about. The, the doctors, the nurses, they were trying to do their best to keep it clean, but yet also tend to the patients. I say, you know what? Isn't that the purpose of a hospital? Isn't that why a hospital exists? It doesn't exist to be clean. It doesn't exist for the doctors and the nurses. It exists for the sick, for those who are in need. Church, let's be that hospital. Let's be a church which is inclusive. A church which welcomes people from all different backgrounds, whether they sound like us or not, whether they dress like us or not, doesn't matter. Let's include them into our family and love them and fulfill the law which Jesus has brought to us that we may love God but also love our neighbours. Amen. So if all heads bow and eyes close, I just want to give us some time of response. Give us some time to, to respond to God. Throughout the week, this and throughout even the, the entire um, series, this word came into my mind time and time again. This phrase, stop professionalizing your Christianity. Stop professionalizing your Christianity. For some of us here, church, we have been to church, we have been to service for so many years that we know the routine. I admit to you, yes, uh, to all of us that I am guilty of it that I have been to church for so many years I have done this I stood on this stage so many times that I know the drill I know what's going to happen next but I pray that that will not stop us from really truly being who God has called us to be I pray that that will not hinder us from really opening up our hearts once again and being malleable and being ready and being surrendered before God and say, God, would you continue to speak to me in the most intimate manner? God, bring me back to the time of my salvation where I was so hungry for you, where I was so open and so ready to be changed and transformed. Would you use me in this manner? May I not just be so familiar and think that just because I've checked up all the boxes, just because I've gone through all of the Christian education classes already, just because I've done my due time and I've served this amount of years and that's why I'm safe. God, today we come before you humbly. We come before you and we, we just lay ourselves before you on the operating table and I pray, oh God, that you would do a pharisectomy right now and you take out the Pharisee in us 
God that there will not be any more legalism, there will not be any more hypocrisy, there will not be any more self-righteousness, but you live in us a heart which is humble, a heart which is pure, a heart which is so sensitive to your heartbeat that we will then just go forth out of this place, out of this world, and into the world, into the hurt, into the those who, who need you and we will be able to exemplify your love to them. So right now, if if there are those of us here who, who, who are saying, you know, throughout this whole series, the last three weeks, right, I, there seems to be that self-righteousness. I know it's not easy for all of us to admit it. There, there, there seems to be that, that hypocrisy. There seems to be that legalism. And God, forgive me for that. Forgive me for, for being so familiar. And right now, I just want to lay myself down and I just want to be pure, and broken before you and say, God, have your way in my life once again. Would you show up in the most real manner once again? If that's you, church, uh, then would you just raise up your hand so that we can pray for you? We have some leaders around. I know it's not easy, church, but this is just, just between, yeah, it's just about you and how you can exemplify who God has called you to be. Again, for those of us watching online, if you want prayer, then just scan the QR code and we have a leader there ready in the Zoom prayer room to pray together with you. You know, church, there's no condemnation about this. This is not about judging anybody because I would be the first to raise my hand and say, God, forgive me. God, search my heart right now. Shine light at things which you want to read out, things which is not from you. And would you have your way to mold me? And Father, I pray that as a church, Calvary Assembly of God, we will be a church ready to love, ready to make a difference, ready to impact the community for your glory. Lord Jesus, we run to you, Lord, because we want to stand in the gap between the living and the dead. We want to stand in the gap and be your intercessor and be the one, O oh Lord Jesus, who will be able to bring transformation and bring revival into this land. In the most mighty name we pray. Amen. May I invite all of us to stand right now as uh, Audrey, she leads us in this song, Making a Difference. Would you make this your heart's cry as well? All across this room, make this your prayer. Whether you're here or also whether you're in your living rooms, in your bedrooms, or wherever you are, make this your prayer. God, I want to make a difference. I don't just want to come to church and, you know, tick off some checklist and then just think, it's, oh yeah, I'm, I'm okay, I'm righteous, I'm safe, and that's all there is to Christianity. But God, fulfill the destiny which you have placed in me, that I will be your hands and your feet, that I will be your mouthpiece, that I will be your ambassador, that I will be your witness, that I will go out and be your minister of reconciliation because that, you know, church is what, God has placed in every single one of us that we will be God seekers building lives not just here in church on service but every day everywhere and with every one so make this your heart's cry right now would you Lord take a look at our hearts